Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this short game into the comp video, we're going to be having an update to the AM4 platform, and then we're going to be discussing some latest rumors concerning Vega 10. So, first things first, let's start out with AM4. Now, it is, of course, the rather important socket type which AMD are going to be pioneering for both the usage of Zen, also known as Summit Ridge on the desktop, but also Bristol Ridge and other future APUs from the company. So this platform essentially allows you to switch out your CPU or processor depending on your usage scenario. Just to get everyone onto the same page as well, it is going to be adding native PCIe 3.0 technology, USB 3 and USB 3.1 and going to feature up to dual channel DDR4 memory support which means you can have up to four DDR4 memory modules and from what we're hearing the maximum speed that they can operate is 3200 megahertz which means quite a lot of memory bandwidth to be honest with you which is going to be pretty damn critical for APUs but also for high highly threaded CPUs. Another rather nice bonus is for the high-end um, chipsets, we'll get into that in just a second, you can have up to 24 PCIe lanes, which means that for multi-graphics card solutions, you're not going to have bandwidth constraint issues or for other usage with PCIe adapters. So the pin count for these um, sockets has obviously increased quite considerably over the old AM3. You're looking at a 30, uh, sorry, excuse me, a 40% uh, increase in pins. If memory serves, the AM, uh, AM3 Plus platform, which of course Excavator and most other um, recent processors from AMD has been running on, has a pin count of just 942, and even Intel's AGE LGA1151 only has, well, 1151 pins, so we're starting to see quite the increase for AMD. Don't forget, though, eventually we're going to see AMD releasing Raven Ridge, which is going to be even more insane. From what we can understand, Raven Ridge is going to pack in up to four Zen cores. Um, we've discussed this quite a, in depth a while ago on the channel, but from what we're hearing, assuming the, assuming the rumors are accurate, it's also going to have high bandwidth memory on the same um, chip, on the same APU. So the performance, theoretically, in games should be pretty damn impressive. Motherboard vendors are already starting to build up their stock. So that would be the MSIs, the ASUSs, and Gigabytes, and whomever else are producing boards for AMD. And there are going to be a few different derivatives of the chipset. And these range for essentials, which is basically the OEM people. These are for people who don't necessarily want to do overclocking or watch gaming. They're not going to have high-end number of uh, PCIe, PCIe uh, express lanes and that type of thing. It's going to basically be just it works and that's going to be the A320. The, the B350 on the other hand is going to have a great deal more flexibility. We're not exactly sure what that means in reality but they're saying for power users. So we assume that it possibly will feature enough uh, slots for multi-GPU configurations, but it doesn't appear, given by the description, that we are going to see maximum PCIe bandwidth, so you might still start to run into issues if you're running this with like a very high-end graphics card, um, and possibly some rudimentary overclocking. And then finally, you have the X370, which is going to be for the enthusiast market. And from AMD's own, dis uh, own description, this is going to be for overclockers and tweakers who need a robust platform, comprehensive, low-level control, and ultimate graphics card bandwidth. And that, of course, is where they unleash the full performance of the AM4 platform. And theoretically, it's going to mean that you're going to get the best possible um, ratio of... Uh, uh, of uh, performance out of your hardware. Now, obviously, there are some questions like how well does Bristol Ridge even perform, or, or rather Summit Ridge even perform, that would be more appropriate to say, and how well does it even overclock, and that kind of makes um, us question whether uh, the X370 or whatever is actually going to be worth it. For example, if it doesn't overclock well for them, then it doesn't really make sense to go for an overclocking board. But, of course, at the end of the day, we're not too familiar yet with even what the uh, final clock speeds for the processor are, let alone how well it overclocks. All we've seen is those um, tantalizing uh, benchmarks from the engineering samples, which are running at just 3 gigahertz. So how much is left in the tank? Your guess, as usual, is as good as mine. 
Now I do want to touch on Mega 10 as a couple of pieces of information actually slipped by me so this is more of a PSA public service announcement um, and for me kind of missing this but basically as you're probably aware there are various technology conferences and um, and uh, investor meetings which go along now from what we're hearing from Mark Papermaster from AMD who is AMD's chief technology officer he has cleared up that Vega itself will offer quote significant performance and power efficiency improvements over the current Polaris architecture now the reason that's important is because it starts to lead us to quite a few questions what we do know is that Vega 10 supposedly this is given from leaks which happened way back when on LinkedIn that Vega 10 will offer up to 4096 shader processors which theoretically means you can have about 10 teflops of performance that depends obviously on the final clock speeds and all of that jazz but also up to 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory to memory which is absolutely just crazy now we have heard that the release date is going to be at some point in the first half of next year which is unfortunate I wish it was this year but it is what it is now the fact that they're actually saying that it's going to offer well in their words significant improvements that's kind of interesting because it makes me wonder if AMD are even targeting the GTX 1070 and 1080 with this particular product now obviously at the end of the day I don't have this information because I'm not in their offices and I don't have access to their own internal benchmarks or even have seen the silicon uh, stagnant let alone actually running However, I do wonder, given this time frame and from what we know about NVIDIA's Volta architecture, if AMD have somewhat delayed it so that they can actually compete against NVIDIA's Volta. Because let's say for the sake of argument, they released um, Vega 10, whatever the hell that ends up being called, at, let's say November, December-ish, and then Volta comes out just a short time later and ruffle stomps it because it's you know one technology step ahead it's like a improved architecture that doesn't really make sense so maybe AMD decided to delay it just to take on Volta or another potential possibility is that they just didn't weren't ready and AMD have been very cagey when it comes to Vega they've not really said what it is most folks including myself early on basically thought that Vega and Polaris were basically brothers we only thought that the difference was is that you got a whole bunch of extra cores on Polaris you stuffed them together you put in a different memory controller and you threw in high bandwidth memory to them slightly, slightly simplifying it but I do wonder if they're actually doing something a bit different it's possible that if they're going for extra performance and power efficiency improvements that we could see even further improvements to the various uh, tweaks that have given the Polaris architecture and that would be primitive disk card accelerator and various other bits and bobs inside the actual internals of the card which essentially means that it's more efficient at processing a scene and the other thing is maybe they're going to be more aggressive pushing the clocks so if you've seen the RX 470, RX 480 and you've tried to overclock it you'll know one of the issues with the card is that you can't really go above about 1300 megahertz there are some third party versions of the card which have additional power connectors which you can certainly get more out of but just from a general rule of thumb you're looking at around 1300 to 1350 and compare that to let's say the GTX 1070 or the 1080 or even the 1060 which comfortably operates at around the 1700 1800 megahertz range you can start to see where there's a bit of a disparity so hopefully AMD can fix that. The last thing I do want to touch on is the anniversary of RTG um, which is obviously Radeon Technology Group. So Radeon Technology Group was essentially spun off by AMD, it's obviously a subdivision of the company and it was established last year in September and it had a very simple purpose it was to basically focus purely on graphics technology without the oversight and the less bureaucracy it was basically just to say okay these group of individuals will do whatever is best for graphics so that would be for graphics for mobile graphics for PC graphics for consoles and so on now 
since then they've released a series of achievements for example back in November 2015 they released Crimson Drivers Jesus I'm pretty sure they've stolen a lot of my names I'm just joking but um, uh, Radeon Software back in the day was okay I'm talking the early Catalyst they were okay I didn't personally have any major crashes or anything like that and I was using the Radeon 9800 Pro I used the X800 XT and a couple of others, and I've gone between AMD, NVIDIA, 3DFX, and a couple of other vendors quite frequently, as regular viewers know. But I will say that I think GeForce definitely did have a bit of an advantage when it came to drivers, in terms of their usability, uh, for quite a number of years. However, Crimson drivers have certainly improved this, and I would make a compelling argument that in some ways... AMD's drivers are better than NVIDIA's now when it comes to the basics. Now, I do feel that the shadow play and other bits and bobs which are thrown into the GeForce experience certainly help edge NVIDIA in many different ways, but in terms of basic control, I do really like Crimson Drivers. And then, obviously, we've seen the first public demo with FinFET, real-time HDR rendering, which we all know that... in uh, AMD, NVIDIA and a lot of other manufacturers including Sony and Microsoft are really pushing. GPU open launch was really nice. The idea here is that AMD would open up the GPU's uh, various technology, they would let vendors tweak it, they would let uh, developers tweak it and they could basically do whatever they wanted with the code, it was really nice. Uh, Vulkan drivers, we've actually had an in-depth interview with Vulkan, if you want to check it out on the channel you can search YouTube Red Gamer Tech Vulkan interview and it will pop right up. Radeon Pro Duo launched, which is basically more for developers. Um, I don't really feel that it's super interesting for the average person but, you know, it was obviously had high levels of compute performance and so on. And then they updated the logo, which isn't particularly amazing. Radeon.com went online. It really shocked me that they didn't have that up earlier to compete with GeForce.com, but whatever. Polaris launch, of course, also started to happen. And then we started to see the day one Linux support, which was fantastic. And then obviously it keeps going. And supposedly now they've reached 101 different FreeSync displays as of August uh, 2016 and now it's time for them to aim for the stars again whatever the hell that means so I assume that that's going to mean Vega but anyway I think that's just about it for this particular video hopefully we've got some information coming up soon for NVIDIA's Volta architecture that would just be gosh darn swell um, yesterday of course we went into an in-depth thing on Intel's Coffee Lake I'm currently conducting a review of an SSD, so hopefully that's going to be up in the next couple of days, which is a crucial SSD. It's actually really shiny, I must admit. And also I have a keyboard review that I'm working on as soon as I finish that as well. So hopefully you've enjoyed this stuff. I also want to take a look at the PlayStation 4 Pro. I was just about to say the PlayStation 4 Neo, but that would be incorrect. The PS4 Pro's... Um, various rendering technology because I'm getting quite a few questions on how that works so I might throw that in and there's possibly a chance that Scorpio whatever the hell that ends up being called I place your bets by the way on what the Xbox Pro um, what the Xbox Pro slash Xbox Elite or Scorpio or whatever the hell it's going to end up being is going to be the final name and with that said I'm going to let you all go so take care of yourselves bye for now